Well, good morning, Tower View. Uh, this is Pastor Nelson, Associate Power pa Pastor at Tower View Baptist Church. Easy for me to say, huh? It's been a tongue twister type of day. This is, um, I'm recording this, it's not live today, I'm recording this. It's Saturday night in my undisclosed location in Wichita, Kansas. It's Army Weekend. I haven't been to Army Weekend since March because of this whole COVID thing. And so I am down here for the weekend, and I am recording this, like I said, on Saturday night to be broadcast on Sunday morning. So good morning to you all. Uh, to those who don't know me, I'm Associate Pastor I'm Nelson at Tower View Baptist Church in Kansas City, Missouri. You can check out our website at towerviewkc.com. tells you all about us, our events that are coming up, our services. You can find other Sunday school lessons like this one. You can find sermons and songs from previous weeks and from this week. If they're not posted there already, they will be um, Sunday morning. So thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And we're going to continue our study in the book of Isaiah. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you for all the blessings that you give us, Lord. Help us to be your servant in all that we do. Help us as we study your word in Isaiah, Lord, that you can open our hearts, open our minds, that you can change our hearts, change our minds, change what we do in this life to glorify you. And we just pray all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. So we've been going through the book of Isaiah, and we've seen some unusual things in Isaiah. He, Isaiah it was taken up into heaven and seen a vision from heaven. Whether he was there or was a vision, it doesn't matter. He was there in his mind. Last week we looked at a section of scripture where it was an, like apocalyptic, talking about the end of times in the far future. It's still future to us. And this section of scripture, beginning in chapter 36, is a, a section of narrative. So it's not some of the prophecies and sermons that Isaiah has, but it's, it's mostly just narrative of events that are happening in Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. And actually, many of these events, and, and almost word for word, are, you can find in the book of 2 Kings, or chapter 19, in the, ver in the chapters around chapter 19. And so the, these verses are in two places. But here in chapter, starting in 36, we're, the lesson plan is in 37. It focuses in on 37, but to set the scene, we need to start in 36. So in 36, in Isaiah chapter 36, in verse 1, it says this, in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib of Assyria attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his royal spokesman, along with a massive army from Lachesh, to the king Hezekiah at Jerusalem. The Assyrian stood near the conduit of the upper pool by the road to the launderer's field. So this conduit, this upper pool, is the same place that Isaiah confronted King Ahaz back in chapter 7. King Ahaz is Hezekiah's father. So King Ahaz has died. Hezekiah has grown up and has now become the king. So we see here it's the 14th year. Possibly this was a, 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 a typo, so to speak. It might be his, actually his 24th year. In in Hebrew, there's a very subtle difference between 14 and 24. And so it could be an, e, an e, easily, could be a, a, a copying error. But it doesn't matter. King Hezekiah had been king for a while. Assyria was still a power. Assyria, about 20 years prior to this, had attacked and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, where the capital was Samaria. And so they, Assyria had conquered many of the nations all around Judah. And Assyria always won. Assyria was not defeated. And here they are. They're in Judah. They attacked the Jewish city of Lachesh. And now the next one up is Judah, the capital, the big city. 
And as you read through 36, I'm not going to read through all of it, but read through chapter 36, and as you read through that, you will see that uh, the king of Assyria sent a delegation to Jerusalem. And just like you see in the movies, there was a delegation standing outside the city on the ground, speaking to a delegation of from Judah standing on top of the wall. And they're talking to each other. And as you read through chapter 36, you read that conversation. And you can read about the arrogance of the Assyrians and how they threatened Judah. And how they said they have conquered all these other nations and their gods were useless. Um, and so you can read about that. And how they said Hezekiah is, is a useless king. We're going to beat him and, and your God is, is powerless. We are more powerful than your God. And after that conversation, we get to chapter 37. In chapter 37, verse 1, this is Hezekiah's response to that conversation that was done on the wall. Hezekiah didn't go up on the wall because he didn't want to be hit by an assassin's arrow. So both, neither king was there. They, there was their delegations talking to each other. But in chapter 37, verse 1, it says this, When King Hezekiah heard their report, he tore his clothes put on sackcloth, and went to the Lord's temple, to Yahweh's temple. He didn't say, okay, send out messengers. We need, we need allies. Send out messengers to all the kingdoms around him. Go down to Egypt, to Africa, to Greece. He, no, he didn't do that. He went to God. He also sent another delegation to Isaiah. Isaiah was in the city. And he sent another uh, delegation. He said, go talk to Isaiah. Ask him what God is, what is God's going to do about this? So King Hezekiah's response, unlike his father's, was to seek God. He did that by ripping his clothes, a sign of mourning. Putting on sackcloth, you think burlap, as a sign of mourning. Many people already died from the attack on Lakesh and the other cities around Judah, all the smallest towns. Many of those people have fled. You may have seen a movie. They fled to Helm's Deep. Well, here they're fleeing to Jerusalem. The city on the hill that has a formidable defense. They have a water supply on the inside so they won't go thirsty. They may run out of food, but they won't run out of water. But yet they're surrounded by a huge army. And there's no Gandalf around to save them. All they have is God. Is God enough? Is God enough for King Hezekiah? Is God enough for you? So they sent out this delegation. Well, it turns out that while this is happening, it says in, in verses 8 and 9, that some of the other kings that King Hezekiah did not send letters to, but they on their own attacked the Assyrians. And so the Assyrians left Lachesh and they left Jerusalem to go face this threat. It says that the kings of Cush came to fight the Assyrians. And so it appeared that their siege was over. They were going to be rescued. But the king of Assyria sent a, a letter to King Hezekiah. I'm going to read that. Verse 10. This is the letter that was sent to King Hezekiah. And then quote. When, so in, at the end of verse 9 it says, So when he heard this, he sent messengers to Hezekiah saying, in verse 10, quote, Say this to the king of Judah. Don't let your God... He didn't call him Yahweh, he just said God. Don't let your God, on whom you rely, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem won't be handed over to the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries. They completely destroyed them. Will you be rescued? Did the gods of the nations that my predecessors destroyed rescue them? Of Gozan and Haran and Rezpa, or I'm sorry, Rezeph, and Edenites, and Te Telesar. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharathim, Hena, or Iva? 
Have you heard of any of those? I haven't. Why? Because the king of Assyria destroyed them. They were good at destroying things and destroying the people. So even if they did not kill all the people, they moved them to some other location. So they weren't a people anymore. When he conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, he sent the people into exile to a place we don't know. And they lost their identity. When you hear about the lost tribes of Israel, that's what he's, it's talking about, is those northern tribes that disappeared from existence. And the king of Assyria moved other people into the northern kingdom of Israel to settle, to resettle Samaria. They were not Jewish by descent, by blood. But God sent lions in there. You can read all about this in other places in the Bible. Lions in there. And they pleaded to the king. And so the king sent a few priests back from that had been exiled to teach them the ways of Yahweh. And so by the time that the New Testament happened, the time of Jesus, they, 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 these were people who weren't pure Israelites. And that's why the Jews didn't like them and avoided them and went around Samaria because they weren't really Jewish. Not by blood. But all that came about this time period from the king of Assyria. And so this is even setting up all these events are setting up Jesus. Setting it all up. And so they sent the king sends this letter. The king of Assyria sent this letter to the king Hezekiah. How did King Hezekiah respond? And that's where your lesson plan books up. So we're in lesson seven of your of your lesson plan, Isaiah thirty seven and verse fourteen. And this is what it says, in verse 14, it says, Hezekiah took the letter from the messenger's hands, read it, then went up to the Lord's temple, Yahweh's temple, and spread it out before Yahweh. Then Hezekiah prayed to Yahweh, to the Lord. So what was Hezekiah's response? He took this letter to the temple. Now Hezekiah was not allowed inside the temple. It's not like our churches today. Only the priest could go inside the temple. Inside the temple was a big room. And they would bake bread and put it in there every day. They would burn incense to, uh, to scent the place. But also to, um, it is a symbol of the prayers of the people. They had a menorah, a light candle, like you see in Hanukkah. that came from inside the temple. That they had to uh, fill with oil and keep the wicks and everything, and keep it lit and burning. They had to clean the place. But inside, in the back of the temple, was a big curtain. And behind that curtain was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And the priest couldn't go in there, but one time a year, the chief priest could go in there once a year during the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And he could only go in there after, first he had to offer, offer a sacrifice for himself. Then they had to offer another sacrifice for the entire nation of Israel. And he had to go in there with the blood of those sacrifices. His only reason he was allowed to go in there, one day a year. On top of that was two cherubim, where we get the idea of angels with wings. And their wings were spread out across the top of it. And they were just touching and that was called the mercy seat of God, where God sat. Now, did God literally sit there? No, God encompasses the whole earth. But it was a symbol that people could rally around. And you can see, this is where God... But there was no picture of God. There was no statue of God. There were a picture of, of cherubim, of a godly creation. But there was no picture of God in there. Because God cannot be pictured. You will not make a graven image of God. That's the Ten Commandments. But there it was. And Isaiah, Hezekiah went out to this temple. And he probably was on the altar, the actual altar where they sacrificed the animals. The sheep and the oxen and the pigeons, where they pour out the grain and oil offerings. The altar is actually outside the temple. In, in what's called the inner court. And that's probably where Hezekiah went. He probably went, and that's where he put this letter on that altar, and gave it to God. 
gave it to Yahweh. He says that over and over here. Yahweh, God, you are my Lord. And what is his prayer? His prayer starts in verse 16 and goes to 20. So let's read his prayer. Lord of armies, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you are God, you alone. All of the kingdoms of the earth, you made the heavens and the earth. Listen closely, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Hear all the words that Sennacherib has sent, sent to mock the living God. Lord, it is true that the king of Assyria, the kings of Assyria, have devastated all these countries and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but were made from wood and stone by human hand. So they have destroyed them. Now, Lord our God, save us from his power, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are God, you alone. What a prayer. It wasn't a long prayer. A prayer, how many seconds was it? It wasn't very long. Maybe it took me a minute to read it. Maybe. But look how he starts this prayer. Lord of armies, Yahweh, Lord of hosts. You are the God. You, you are powerful. You have armies greater than the king of Assyria. Part of the reason for Hezekiah's terror is because, Hezek because the Assyrian army was much greater than the, Jew the Judah Jewish army, the army of Judah. They had more people, they had more men, they had better weapons, they were better trained. And so earthly, you know, wise, you know, they didn't have chance to go up against the, the Assyrian army. But God is the Lord of armies. He has a bigger army. Hezekiah remembers the accounts of uh, Elijah and Elisha when Elisha showed the servant the armies of God that surrounded them. Hezekiah remembers that. He knows that God is sitting on his throne. He knows the story he knows the story. He knows the account that Isaiah told him when God took him up to heaven. That we read about in Isaiah chapter 6. Because you are the God. You alone are God. There are not many gods roaming this earth. You are the only God that's roaming this earth. Everything else is just man-made gibberish. Man-made stories. Man-made statues. They're, they're nothing. Because you... You're the ruler of all the kingdoms of this world, including Assyria. You and you are the creator of this world, of the heavens and the earth. The heavens, that's just another way of saying the sky and everything above us. You are the ruler, you are the creator of the blue sky above us. The clouds, the stars, the moon, the sun, all of that, God, you created it all. And of the earth. The dirt, the sand, the rocks, the mountains, the valleys, the oceans. God, you created it all. So he's worried about for his life. And what is he praying? He's praising God for his creation. When you pray, do you begin with praising God for his creation? For honoring God for his power over this world? Even as you pray for the healing of somebody you know and love. That's how he begins his prayer. He's worried for his life. He's worried for the life of his people. He's the king. He is responsible for all the people of Judah. Many of them have, have died already. Many are about to die if Assyria attacks. They could all die. And if the ones that don't die will be enslaved. And he starts off praising God for his creation and for his power and his sovereignty over the world. Do you pray that way? You go, well, I'm not smart enough to know those what kind of words. Well, okay, well, the words are right here for you. They're right there. Can you read them? Make that your prayer. Say these exact words in your prayer. Open your eyes and read them as a prayer. And see how God changes your heart and changes your mind. He continues his prayer in verse 17. 
Listen closely, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Hear all these words. What? That sounds kind of... How is he praying? Doesn't he know God already hears? But when you're desperate, when you're hurting, doesn't it feel like God doesn't, isn't around? That's what Hezekiah felt like. He said, God, where are you? Are you listening? Are you watching? God, please listen. Please watch. This is a plea to God. Yes, God's watching. Yes, God's listening. And sometimes you know that in your head, but you don't feel that in your heart. And that's where Hezekiah was. And he's pleading to God from his heart. I'm sure he wasn't just, you know, listen closely, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Hear all the... No, that's not how he's praying. He's praying in desperation. He's crying out to God in desperation because he sees no way out. This is a no-win situation. There is no way he can overcome this king. He knows there is no alliances left out there that are helpful. So he's pleading to God to rescue because that is his only resource only resource. Verse 18, Lord, and that's all caps, that's Yahweh. It is true that the kings of Assyria, kings, so this is not just this current king, all the previous kings too. True that the kings of Assyria have devastated all these countries and their lands. So this is, this is Assyria is just continuing this pattern. They have 20 years earlier wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel and destroyed Samaria. Verse 19, they have thrown their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but made from wood and stone by human hands. Once again, this we know he's listening to Isaiah's sermons. Because Isaiah over and over again talks about this. It's like, why do you worship something that was created by a craftsman? You cut down a tree and hand it to a craftsman who carves it and then paints it and covers it in gold and silver. And then you put it on a shelf and then you honor it as a god. Sounds like a stupid idea to me. That's what Isaiah says. Hezekiah is listening to him. He realizes that these are just statues. They aren't really gods. They're just man-made statues with man-made stories, like fantasy fiction, that, you know, that are talking about these gods as if they were great and powerful and created the world. They didn't. It's, it's just fantasy stories that people have. But people worship them. And they were created by men, and they were destroyed by men. But it wasn't the statues in itself that were destroyed is the big deal. It's just the king of Assyria has destroyed nations, he had destroyed cities, destroyed people's lives. And that's what Hezekiah is afraid of. Because they're next on the list to be destroyed. Verse 20. How does he end this prayer? Now, Lord our God, Yahweh our God, save us from his power. And that's the Assyrian power. So that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord our God, you alone. He doesn't say, save me, God, so I can be comfortable. Doesn't say, save me, God, so I can live a long life. Save me, God, so I can be the good king. He says, save us, God, so that your name will be proclaimed throughout the world. When you pray, do you worry about God's reputation? Do you care how God's name will be reflected to your friends and your family and your neighbors, and to your church? When you pray that God will pay the bills, do you do it? So that God's name will be glorified and that other people will come to salvation because of it? Or do you do it just so, like, God help me, I was a fool and I got all these bills because I bought too many things on credit. And now I can't pay the bills. God help me now because I'm stuck in a situation. Help me, God. You know, I want you to heal this person for me. Because otherwise I'll be lonely. And I'll miss them greatly. 
And so heal them for me. How about healing them for the salvation of others? That others will see what power God has. That God will perform a miracle so that the doctors will believe in God. That God will perform a miracle so your unbelieving family members will see. And their hearts will be changed. Hezekiah prayed for God's reputation. For God's glory to be had, not just in Judah, but throughout the world. The things that we pray for, do we worry about that? When you pray for the election, are you worried about God's glory? Are you praying for your pocketbook because if party A wins, I'll, I'll get more money. I, mean, I don't want party B to win because their, their policies are against, against my morals or whatever the thing is. I don't know which party is going to glorify God. I really don't. Because, Anyways, some of you have a, a strong opinion on that. This is not the place to cover it. But do you worry about God's glory as you pray for whatever you pray for? So look at how Hezekiah prayed. In verse 16 and verse 20, how he bookends this prayer. He begins with praising God for his glory, for his creation, for his power and sovereignty. He closes this prayer by recognizing that God's glory needs to go out to the nations for salvation of the nations so that more will come to God. Do you book in your prayers that way? Are your prayers couched in those terms that God's glory? You might have to... <laughs> Change what you're praying for. So it's like, if you need to use this, pull out your Bible and pull out chapter 37 of Isaiah and use six, verse 16 to begin your prayer and use verse 20 to end your prayer and put your prayer request in between and make sure they fit both of those the ends of the prayer that Hezekiah puts in here. It will change your prayer life. It will change your mind. It will change your heart how you live. Use this scripture as your model prayer, as one of your models for prayer. There are many models in scripture. This is one of them. And what happened after Hezekiah prayed this? So in the lesson plan, they skip ahead to verse 30, and I'll get there. But in verse 21, it says this, Then Isaiah, son of Amaz, sent a message to Hezekiah. So Isaiah wasn't with King Hezekiah when he prayed. Hezekiah went to the temple without the prophet. But Isaiah, because of God's Holy Spirit, Isaiah knew that Hezekiah went there and he, that he prayed. And God gave the prophet Isaiah a message to give to King Hezekiah. And it says, The Lord, the God of Israel, says, Because you prayed to me about King Sennacherib of Assyria... This is what the Lord has spoken against him. And so as you read down through the rest of this chapter, you'll read God's word against the king of Assyria. And so we're going to, I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to skip down to verse 26. And this, and this is still God speaking. It says, Have you not heard? I designed it long ago. I planned it in the days gone by. I have brought it to pass. You, and that's king of Assyria, you have crushed fortified cities in the piles of rubble. Their inhabitants have become powerless, dismayed and ashamed. They are plants of the field, tender grass, grass on the rooftops, blasted by the east wind. So he's talking about all the destruction that the kings of Assyria have done on all the nations around them. God said, yeah, you've done a lot of destruction. I have seen it. I've watched you do it. But in verse 26, I'm sorry, verse 28, 30, Isaiah 37, verse 28, But I, I, God, know you're sitting down, you're going out, you're coming in, and you're raging against me. So God said, you know, he's better than Santa Claus. I know when you sit down, I know when you leave, I know when you come back. 
And I have heard all these words that you've raged against me, claiming your power over me, that you can destroy what I created. Verse 29. Because you're raging against me, and your arrogance have reached my ears. So Isaiah prayed, God, listen, Lord, are you listening? And God said, here, I've, I've heard everything he, King Sennacherib has said. So God was listening. He says, because of your arrogance that have reached my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth. I will make you go back the way you came. So I will put a hook in your nose like a bull. I will put a bit in your mouth like a horse. And I will make you go back. Why do you put a, a hook in a, in a bull's nose? That's how you control him. Bulls are big and they're strong. But with a hook in their nose and a chain on, on, on that hook, you can control him. The same with a bit on a horse. When I was in high school on my grandpa's farm, I controlled four Belgian horses. I weighed less than 100 pounds. And I was controlling four horses that each were on the order of 2,000 pounds each. Pulling a cart that had a motor on it, pulling a hay baler, pulling the hay wagon. There's little old me, less than 100 pounds, pulling controlling all that power. Now think about God's power over a powerful king. That's more than what I had. God can do that. Hezekiah knew that God could do that, but he still pleaded with God to do that. And God says, I'm going to make you go back the way you came. So he says, king of Assyria, you're going to go back to Assyria the way you came without all the things you think you're going to have. He's going to go back without treasure. He's going to go back without slaves. He's going to go back empty-handed. And I, God continues. So the lesson plan picks up on verse 30. And so this is God continuing to speak. But now he's speaking to Hezekiah specifically. How do I know that? Tone of voice, context. He says, this will be the sign for you. This year you will eat what grows on its own. And in the second year, what grows from that? But in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah will take root up downward and bear fruit upward. For a remnant will go out from Jerusalem and survivors from Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. So God says, you will survive. King Hezekiah, you will survive. The kingdom of Judah will survive. There will be a remnant. Some have already been killed because of the battles that happened previously. Some will die because of the overcrowded conditions, the unsanitary conditions in the city of Jerusalem that was occurring as all this is happening. But a remnant will survive. It's not going to be easy. This year, the first year, that's this year, you're just going to have to eat whatever you can find that's just growing in the fields. And because of the Assyrians, you won't be able to plant in the spring. You're just going to have to grow what grows because all the tools are gone. They've either been turned into weapons of war or they've been captured and destroyed by the Assyrians. There are no storehouses with seeds. They've been gone. They've either been destroyed or eaten. And so they have nothing to plant. So they're just going to have to fend off. You ever see a field that sometimes, you know, sometimes you see a, a soybean field with corn stalks in it. You know, that's left over from the year before because they rotated the crops. And so they're just going to have to get whatever grows up naturally. And it's not going to be easy. But they said within three years, you'll start planting again. You'll start growing food. But think about that, even when you plant you have to wait for it to grow and mature so you can harvest it. <clears throat> so it's going to be a tough three years that they're going to have, but they will survive. They will survive. And they will plant roots and they will grow. God uses that word picture. They will physically plant and those physical plants will grow. But the remnant, the people of Judah, will also be planted. They will set roots and they will grow. God says, he says, 
I will, the zeal of the Lord of Omri's will accomplish this. This will be accomplished, not because you're so smart or you have such ingenuity, but because I said it's going to happen, I being God. And then in verse 33, he continues. He says, therefore, this is what the Lord, Yahweh, says to the king of, of Assyria. So this is what God's saying to Assyria, but he's doing it to Hezekiah, so Hezekiah knows what's happening. He says this, he, will, he, the king of Assyria, will not enter this city, or shoot an arrow here, or come with a shield, or build up a siege ramp against it. All the ways you attack a city, the archers from Assyria will not shoot any more arrows at Jerusalem. They will not approach the city hiding behind shields. They won't build up any siege ramps or ladders to scale the walls. Won't happen. None of that's going. There will be no battle for Jerusalem today or this year. Verse thirty-four. God continues. He, that's the king of Assyria, will go back the way he came. He will not enter this city. This is the Lord's declaration. Do you depend on God? Do you believe Him? I, that's God speaking. I will defend this city and rescue it for my sake. For the sake of my servant David. He says, I'm not doing it for you, Hezekiah. I'm doing it for me, God. Because as you prayed, my reputation, the nations will know that I am God. And I, God said, I made a promise to King David to keep one of his line on the throne. And King Hezekiah was, an answer, was part of that answer. King Hezekiah is a descendant of King David. And because of that, he is also an ancestor. And, and Joseph and Mary were born into the line of King David. So King Hezekiah is an ancestor of Joseph and Mary. He says, I will do this. Do you depend on God to do things? Do you trust in him? That even if all heck breaks loose in this land after the election, I pray that it doesn't. Pray that it doesn't, for God's sake. But even if it does, because God says, you know what? That's what needs to happen. That you can still glorify God in the midst of whatever turmoil comes in your life. Whether it's because you lost your job, whether it's because you got a disease, or a cancer, can you still trust God no matter what? And the lesson plan ends there, but you know, what's the rest of the story? So the last verses of this chapter. So verse 36. It says, Then the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Syrians. When the people got up the next morning, they were all the dead bodies. So King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and left. He returned home and lived in Nineveh. He went back where he came from. Minus 185,000 soldiers. Now he probably had way more than that. But they, they weren't near the fighting force that they were. And they lost all the will to fight now. Because somehow, 185,000 died overnight. Were they poisoned? Did they have some all come down with a disease at the same time? I don't know. It doesn't say. Even if I could find a satisfactory earthly answer for it, it doesn't matter. It still is God's timing. Or they had 185,000 heart attacks all at once. But God defended the city. God did it. And then verse 38, it says, One day while he was worshiping, and if you go your history, if you, you go through it, it's like 20 years later. One day is 20 years later. That's like how I say things. I say a few days ago, and it could have been months ago or years ago. One day while he, that's the king, Sennacherib was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, which we don't know who that is. We don't know anything about that god. His sons, Adaramelech and Sherezer, struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. Yes, the same Ararat that Noah landed his boat, which is now the modern day nation of Turkey. Then his son, Esar Hadon, became king in his place. So eventually, he was executed by his own, by his own sons. 
he was killed. He faced his own judgment. Not in the timing that King Hezekiah wanted, because it was 20 years later, but he lived in disgrace for 20 years of over what happened over Jerusalem, and he never conquered Jerusalem. So he had that disgrace for the next 20 years of his life. And then he had the disgrace of being murdered by his own children. So do you pray for God's glory? When you pray for salvation, is it that God will be glorified? Not that you'll just be satisfied that, oh, well, my family's saved. Do you pray for God's glory? That's what King Hezekiah prayed for. He praised God for God's creation, and he prayed for God's glory. That was the bookends of his prayer. It should be the bookends of our prayers, no matter what you're praying for. There is nothing that you cannot pray for, even if it's just a parking space. Do you praise God for his creation? Do you pray that God will be glorified if he answers the prayer? Maybe it changes what you pray for. Because a parking space is kind of selfish. Most of the time. It changes what you pray for. You're praying for God's glory to happen in each and every prayer request. The Lord's Prayer. Well, hallowed be thy name. God, holy is your name. So whether you're praying for something, meaning like God, I... <laughs> I lost my job. My kids don't have anything to eat. Pray that God will be glorified in how he provides food to you. And that your family will see how God provides for you. And they, they will come to know God and, and, and honor God because of that. And maybe others around will see that same miracle. And have to ascribe it to God. So wrap your prayers and praises to God. And in glory to God. And see how that changes your prayers. See how it changes your mind. See how it changes your heart. And it may be that you need to pray that for the first you need to pray to God for the first time. And that and it's a prayer of repentance. Telling God how awful you are, that the sinner that you are, that like in Isaiah chapter six. And Isaiah realized how terrible of a sinner he was, and only God can purify him. Only God could save him. You may have been a Christian for many years. And you, your prayers have been selfish and self-centered. And you need God to change your heart and your mind so you'll be quit being so selfish and self-centered and turn to God and be God-centered and worry about the zeal of God. Let's pray. Lord God, you are the mighty God. Help us serve you. Help us to praise you. We thank you for all that you do. Help us to use this example of Scripture to listen to you. Help us to use this example of Scripture to honor you the way you deserve to be honored and to glorify you the way you deserve to be glorified. Because you are our Creator and you are the only way to our salvation or the salvation of anybody else in this world. We just lift you up and ask that your will be done, and that your name will be glorified in all that happens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I thank you for watching. I thank you for listening. I pray as you watch this that you, if it's Sunday morning, that you'll make your way to church at 1030 for the drive-in service and listen on, on the radio 90.7. Um, inside, you have to have reservations to come in. I pray that you worship God through the study of his word, like this lesson and like the others like it. And through, as you listen to the sermon by Pastor Darren, as you sing songs with Pastor Craig, he is the mighty God. If you want to find out more about us, check out our website at towerviewkc.com. It talks about what we uh, believe, how we, how we worship. And you can find other videos like this there. You can follow us on our Facebook page, Tower View Baptist Church. We're the one in Kansas City, Missouri. We're also on YouTube. So if this has been helpful to you, press the like button, share it with others, share it on your wall, so others can 
can and hopefully not because of my beautiful face or my eloquent words as I stutter and stammer around, but that God's word will be glorified and God will be glorified and, and people will come to know him. If you want to call the church or text the church, you can do that on our number 816-368-1330. So I praise God. I thank you for watching. I thank you for listening. I pray that you have a, a, a wonderful day. Thank you and God bless.